welcome. Thank you for choosing to listen to this spirit-filled word by David Entry. When you catch a word, you have caught God. May you catch a word today that will cause God to change your story. Be blessed. God is a God who always makes history. And when you are with God, you will make history. God our Savior. Say, God is a Savior. Last Sunday, as I spoke about the attributes of God, what are the attributes of God? It's like the characteristics of God. So, the what there are certain aspects of a thing, an object, a person, or something that makes that differentiates the, that thing from others. And when we talk about the attributes of God, the simplest way I can say is like the characteristics of God because uh, Jesus in his own words says no one has seen God at any time. Hmm. No one has seen God. So why are we making noise about God? If you haven't seen God, what makes you think that this is God? That is the argument of um, syncretism or secularism. But every religion is right in itself. Subject, relativism and subjectivism. Every religion is right in itself because you, what, what makes you think that yours is right and somebody's is wrong? Because uh, they, some people put it this way. They say it's like a big room with a big elephant. We are all blind, four blind people. One is holding the tail. He says he thinks it's a, a snake or a rope. Someone is also holding the trunk. He thinks it's a maybe big hose for, uh, you know, um, fire service, yes. Someone is holding the leg. He thinks it's a big tree trunk. Another person is holding the side. He's thinking it maybe it's a large wall, curved wall or something. They are all blind, so... We might all have aspects of God, but no, none of us have it all. That's a lie. That's the lie. See, they, they say these things to make you think that the one who needs to be saved by God is probably okay. So you don't attempt to present the one and only Savior. So what instead of merit? He said a potter has the choice to make a clay into anything. So he will make one clay into a vase. He will make another clay into a clay into a plate. You can't question a porter and say, uh, Romans chapter 9 for your information from verse 18, 19. How dare a porter question a clay? Why are you making me this? He chooses to do what vessels. So here, he says that you can't ask God. He said, but oh, indeed, oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will thou, will, will the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why have you made me thus? You can't be questioning God that. So then look at verse 19. You, you would say then, why does God still find fault uh, for who has resisted his will? So you are asking, but why is God punishing someone who he has planned not to save? Because salvation is all a plan. Uh, I quoted it on Sunday, how God saved us, not according to our works. Uh, who has, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, said, who has called us and saved us, not according to our works but according to his grace or his purpose and grace, which was given to us when? In Christ, when? Before you were born, you already been given grace and his purpose to save you. So they ask questions about why, why is someone suffering all that? The Bible says that he, God has chosen some for purposes of his glory. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we are all going to hell. Hell, you deserve hell. Every human being alive is deserving of hell because the wages of sin is dead. So every human being alive. So why does God choose some? So that he can also use you as a vessel to demonstrate his mercy. Because if he doesn't pick you who don't deserve mercy but deserve judgment, he doesn't pick you to show how merciful he is. No one will know the mercy of God. That's why when we go to heaven, we'll be thinking about his mercies and the blood of the lamb. Because we don't, we, we, when you look at yourself in heaven, you know you don't deserve it. And people who are really saved, when you get to church, you are humble because you know you, shouldn't, you don't deserve being in church. Because one of the evidence of salvation is gratitude to the Savior. And we begin to live like in heaven. You come to church, you feel like, I'm so grateful that I'm here. How many of you have felt that before? How you are grateful that you are in? Because you are, we are the vessels, according to Romans chapter 9, we are the vessels of, of, of his mercy. Verse 22, somewhere there, it talks about vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. So it says that, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. He just wants to make known the riches of his glory. 
You can't challenge him. And there are others who are vessels of wrath. See, but let me go back. So, people have all kinds of ideologies about God. Okay, if you can preach, how can you say uh, G- uh, Jesus is the only one? Maybe, maybe, granting that is, it has some, some logical weight behind it. Maybe we worship the same God. That's fine. Let's examine the God we are worshiping. How do you know this is the God, the same God? Look at the attributes. Is the attributes of a person or of a thing that tells you its distinction from others. So God has never left himself without a witness. The reason why he called the Jews was because he was trying to form a people to sustain a knowledge of God on earth until he himself steps in. Because without the Jews, there wouldn't have been the knowledge of the true God. That is why they were the only people of God and all others were Gentiles and they were not deserving of coming to God because human beings are all sinful. But God chose a a particular group of people. How did he choose them? He chose a man who couldn't give give birth to children, whose body was dead, the wife's womb was dead, so that you can't say, I gave birth. And then through that man, that's why Ishmael is not part of the, the people of God. So through that man, Isaac, who shouldn't have existed anyway. So Isaac's existence was a supernatural activity of God by quickening the dead. Come on, Shadala. By, by, quickening, by quickening the womb of... They say, Abraham believed God who gives life to the dead. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. He gives life to the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. So Abraham believed God. He believed him. He gives life to the dead. So even though he was 99 years old, when God told him you are going to have a child, he believed that God. He didn't consider his body that was now dead, neither the womb, the Sarah's womb that was body that since it was uh, 100 years, and the, the, the deadness of Sarah, we didn't consider that because he knew he was doing, dealing with a God, one of his characteristics is he's a God of impossibilities. And now, now, so God quickened. So Isaac's, Isaac's existence was not an accident and human beings couldn't have planned it. So God waited when they couldn't produce a child and IVF wouldn't work. Nothing could work because they are past the age. Bible talks clearly about how Sarah was past the age of giving birth. Right? There are some things that you can't do after a certain period of time in your life. For instance, if I am called by destiny to be a professional footballer, how many of you know it's too late now? <laughs> because time and chance happens to them all. There's time for everything. There's time for everything. Hallelujah. So it, it's, it's important to understand that there's time for everything. So according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, Sarah was gone past the age of giving birth. He was past the age. She was past the age. It's right there. It says that uh, 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 she... And she bore a child in, uh, when she was past the age. So she's gone past. So now, having that child was not naturally possible. So God had to work a supernatural work in the womb of a woman who couldn't give birth. And not only the woman, but in the body of a man who couldn't send the seed. So the existence of Isaac was purely divine. I, am ten, I tend to believe that Isaac was a manifestation of a word of God that hit Abraham's body. And gave him life. And the same word passed through his body. As soon as he hit Sarah's womb, he brought, gave life. And nine months, the child was born. And that's how the Jews were formed. Because God said, a body has now prepared for me. He started preparing the body of Jesus from the womb of Abraham, from the womb of Sarah in the body of Abraham. That's, that's so somebody asked me years ago, why did God decide to choose the Jews and leave the others? It's not like he decided to choose. He made them. He made them. Why did he make them? Because he wanted a group of people through whom he can also become like one of them. But he can't become one of people who don't know him. And nobody knew God. Bible says that for no man seeks God. Romans chapter 3 verse 11. No man seeks God. No, we didn't know him. We were groping in darkness. For all have gone astray. No, no one. No one seeks God. So God himself then has to seek us. Because we can't seek him. And so he created a people and gave them a relationship so that they can serve the true God. That's the Jews. Over the generations. Over the generations. So the Bible says that in the, full te- in the Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of the woman, born under the law. Don't ignore that. Because he had to be within a certain jurisdiction. Born 
under the law, the law of Moses that made human beings be able to keep a certain level of relationship with God. That's why Jesus had to come within that. Now, Jesus didn't just appear because he's not E.T., extraterrestrial personality. No, Jesus didn't just appear. His genealogy is traceable. He's a real human being. But he's not an ordinary human being. He's so real and yet not ordinary. He's so extraordinary and yet very real. So everything about human existence, eating, drinking, anger, pain, crying, tired, sleeping, everything he was apart from sinning. Because the Bible says that God sent his fault in the, in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 3 and Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. Jesus Christ was tempted at all points like us, yet without sin. So, now, God had to find a way of, eh, thank you, just the word. God has to find a way of keeping the knowledge of God alive on earth. And through the Jew, Jews, he gave them the attributes of God. So the Jews knew God as Jehovah Shammah, God who is present. Jehovah Shalom, God who is at peace. Jehovah Sabbath, God who is the man of war. Jehovah Re uh, Mekadishkem, God our sanctifier. Je Jehovah Ra, God our shepherd. Jehovah Nisi, God our banner. Jehovah Jira, God our provider. Jehovah El Shaddai, God the one who is all sufficient. Jehovah, Je 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 Jehovah El, o o El o Olam. The almighty God. So they knew him. There are several names of God because not one word, not one phrase can capture God. That is why last Sunday as I taught, I said, we knew him, we know him, his attributes. As different, different attributes. In, in Romans chapter 1 verse 18, it says that, watch this, this is very important to understand. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 talks about... For the wrath of God is revealed against God. Let's go to the verse 90. I think it's better for quickly. Uh, Romans chapter 8. The wrath of... All right, go, go to verse, uh, the previous verse. Verse 20. Verse 20, yeah. Since, so, for since the creation of the world, his, say his. his. This is talking about God, the his. God's invisible. What's the meaning of invisible? Cannot be seen. Not only seen, okay, but cannot be humanly seen noticed and discovered. So when you say invisible, it's not just trying to tell what you can see, but humanly, you can't use human apparatus. How can you use, you create a telescope or a, a microscope or a something scope to see ghosts when they come? It's beyond the realm of the natural. Ghosts are not natural. They are spirits. There's no natural apparatus to make you see in the spirit. So God is a spirit. According to John chapter 4 verse 24, God is a spirit. Let's all say that together. God is and in John chapter 1 verse 18, Jesus says, no one has ever seen God. And yet God is a spirit. So how do we know God? How do we know that this God you know is true? He, he revealed himself. He did not leave himself without a witness. He didn't leave himself, Acts chapter 14 verse 17. He didn't leave himself without a witness. He showed that he's still around. How? Through the Jews. And watch this. So in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, it talks about for since creation, since when? Creation. The, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Guess what? He said the thing that cannot be seen have been seen. It cannot be seen. Invisible. You can't just depict them. But they are clearly, in other words, it's so obvious. God, ah, thank you, Lord. God has put his attributes on display. He has put his attributes, it is called by theologians, immediate revelation of God. You don't need mediation. Immediate means without mediation. It's media. Media. Media is like a medium. So we have the social media, print media, the electronic media. Media is means to transfer information. Now, when we talk about God's immediate revelation, it's the revelation of God that doesn't need anyone to tell you. All you need is to be alive and your, your brains are working. That is why it is actually, you don't have to be educated to know there is a God somewhere. Yeah. Oh, since time of, times of antiquity, Every, everywhere you go, human, when there are human beings there, you, you see they have a form of worship. Human beings everywhere have a form of worship. But who told them they should worship? 
Who told them? How did they know? We are? Because when you go to remote some, some natives somewhere, you find that they, they have a form of worship. There's one thing common about human nature. Different eating, drinking, reproduction, worship. Animals eat, they drink, they reproduce, but they can't worship. <laughs> that distinguishes us from animals. And so, but the problem is everybody is worshiping. How do you know who is having, or there are different gods like Hindus will tell you. Every God is fine. Just be worshiping. Just be worshiping. Once it's your God, it's your God. You can't impose your God on anybody. But then if there is a God, there is a true God somewhere, then he must be known. Now, the reason why everyone worships, because it doesn't take education. It doesn't take any unique enlightenment to just know there is God. When, once you are born, even if you are Tarzan, very soon you will be looking for means to worship. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there, there is God. It is Atheism must be educated. It must be a function of education. Atheism is another wild form of brainwashing. They say you are being brainwashed. Atheism is a real brainwashing. Because atheism is not natural. Oh. Atheism is not natural. You must be taught and forced to think strangely before you think that, oh, okay, this is also an option. Oh, yeah. You must, be, you must be taught to think that a, a man can also be pregnant. You know, it's not normal. But you have to be taught. Some people must teach you and teach you and make you think that a man can be pregnant, even though it's not true. Because some things must be taught. They are not natural. So now sometimes you place some things in the field or in the realm of inter- intellectualism, but it's pure madness. Mere, sorry, I said pure. Mere madness. <laughs> So, you don't need to be education, educated. The slightest, the base, basis of common sense will let you know there is God. So, on the flip side, it takes a certain level of foolishness to say there's no God. That's why, you know, Sam said in the book of Psalm 14 verse 1, he said, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God because since creation, the invisible attributes of God are clearly manifested. So everywhere you go, you will just see people who know there is God somewhere. There is a God. Some people call him God, some God. Some people call rivers, they are God. Some people call cows, they are God. Some people call elephant, they are God. Some people call human beings, they are God. Some people call their emperor, they are God. They call Caesar, God. They call the king, God. They call all kinds of things, God. Some people call twins, God. Some people call somebody, an old lady who hasn't died, has lived for long, they say God. They have all kinds of things they call God because they are looking for God. Some call trees, God. Some call rocks, God. Some call mountains God. Some call rivers God. But there must be a true God somewhere. And the heart of man is looking for the true God. Shout yes! Since creation, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. And are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So you look at the way the sun operates. It has some mysticism about it. The mind can't understand it, so we, are, we credit it with deity. Instead of it making us look for the one behind it. Because God cannot be re- researched by human beings. Anything that he has made that, sh- that looks unusual, we credit it with deity. You cannot worship a God you don't know. So in Acts chapter 17 verse 23, Paul told them that, the God, therefore, when I was walking around, I saw one altar. You have, they have a lot of altars, different God, different God. Then there's one altar because these, these guys were so philosophical, Athenians, they're so philosophical, they felt like there must be a God somewhere we don't know. So they have several gods, altar, all, everywhere you go, this altar for this God. Different, different. And then yet, they, they, in their intelligence, realized that maybe there's a God we have missed. We don't know. Because definitely there's a God. There's still a God somewhere. So they concluded, they, let's build an altar to the God we don't know. Then Paul said, when I walked through your cities, I saw different altars. But I saw one particular one dedicated to the God you don't know. Him whom you are worshipping without knowing, him I declare to you. <laughs> 
And he says that in the time of ignorance, God winked. He said, no problem. You didn't know, so no problem. But it's verse, verse 30 he says, truly, the times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Yes. That's why we go and preach the gospel. Yes. All men where? Everywhere. How many men? More. How many men? More. Where? only the Jews because he's not only the God of the Jews. He's the God of all flesh. He's the God of all flesh. He's the God of all flesh. So there is a certain type of revelation of God that you don't need to be told. You just get to know about it. However, the true God must be revealed. He revealed himself to the Jews and give them the oracles so that they are custodians of the revelation of God so they can pass it on to people. That is why the heathen king said, Daniel, your God whom you worship, he knew that this, your God is different. That's why the king Nebuchadnezzar told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that your God is the God of all gods. Amen. We have gods, but your own is different. Amen. Wherever they show up with their God, Everyone knows that Alagbara himself has arrived. <laughs> Everyone knows that Oga has arrived. Igwe has arrived. <laughs> when he shows up, who are you to stand against this God? He, he, he can just blow and the rest he goes back. The rest he parts. No one can stop him. No one can stop him. He is the God. Nebuchadnezzar tried to flex. When God reduced him and he became like an animal for seven years. When he came to his senses, I think in Daniel chapter um, 734, 437, somewhere there. He says that I confess that he is God, the true God of all. And all nations, everybody must worship this God. <laughs> He, he passed a law. He made a confession that every this God is true. And the Jews knew his attributes. And one of the major attributes they knew about God is that God is a savior. That God is a savior. So when they came out of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 15, Exodus chapter 15, verse 1 and verse 2. The Bible says, Moses, they sang a song. Oh, I feel like preaching. They said, they said and then and the Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider is thrown into the sin. Doesn't this sound like someone who has come out from lockdown? Yeah. <laughs> then you go, they go on to say that. Watch this, the verse 2. The Lord is my strength. He is my song. And he has become? He has become? For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord is my strength. He has, is my song. He has become my salvation. Psalm 118, verse, verse 4, verse 14. It talks about the Lord is my strength and my song. Hallelujah. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. God is your salvation. In Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. Listen to Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Jehovah, that's Jah, the Lord, is my strength. He is my song. And he also has become my my salvation. Shout God my Savior. Shout God my Savior. Please be seated. In the book of Psalm 65 verse 5, we find out there that God is the God of salvation. He's a Savior. By awesome deeds in righteousness, you will answer us. Oh God, of our salvation. He's the God of our salvation. Psalm 106 verse 21. He is the, the God of Israel. The, save, the Savior. He says that they forgot God their Savior who had done great things in Egypt. 
They forgot God. Who is God? Their Savior. Their Savior. They forgot God, their Savior. Who has done great things in Egypt? Psalm, uh, Isaiah 45, verse 15. It talks about God. He's the, he's the Savior of Israel. He says that truly, you are God who hides yourself. Oh, God of Israel, the Savior. God is a Savior. When Jesus, when Jesus' birth was announced to Mary, and Mary went to Elizabeth's house, and she, salu- he, she saluted her Elizabeth. Bible says Elizabeth, when Elizabeth heard the sound of her salutation, the baby in her womb leaped for joy, and she was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she opened her mouth with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you amongst women. Blessed are you. And they say, how am I favored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Then Mary sang the Magnificat. She sang, it's verse 45, verse 46. Mary said, my soul does magnify the Lord. Watch this, watch this. And Mary said, my soul does, verse 47, magnify the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God. In God. God, my Savior. you that Mary was ordinary like you and I who also needed a savior. Mary was a sinner just like you and I and needed a savior. But what people fail to understand is that God is a savior and God is interested in saving the sinner more than the sinner is interested in being saved. God is so much a savior we don't have to beg him to save a sinner. We don't have to do anything for him to want to save a sinner. Why? Because he's the savior. So it doesn't matter how bad your sin is. He's just a savior. That's his attribute. He saves sinners. When Jesus was born and his birth was announced to the angel, they said in the town of Bethlehem, in Luke chapter 2 verse 11, a savior... For there is, there is born to you this day in the city of David. <laughs> a savior! In fact, when the angel announced his birth, his impending birth to Joseph, who was not sure why his woman was pregnant by someone he didn't know. The angel told him that take care like that because what is happening to her is of God. And he says that for she shall give birth and they shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. It's only sinners who need a savior. God in scripture and in the New Testament is depicted as God who is a savior. So as maybe if because of my time, I might not be able to come back to mention this, but let me just mention it whilst I'm running through the scriptures in John chapter 4, verse 42. You know the woman of Samaria, when she went and told the people, the people came and they believed Jesus. And now they said, we, we, what did they say? Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for, our, our, for we ourselves have heard him and we, oh, we know that this is indeed the Christ. Shout hallelujah! This indeed is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world! <laughs> Shout the book of First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. When T. Paul was introducing himself, he talks, calls himself an apostle and he begins to say that apostle by the commandments of God. In First Timothy chapter 2 verse 3, he makes reference to God as Savior. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God as Savior. In First Timothy chapter 4 verse 10, I feel like preaching for this is this for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is he is not the savior of the Jews he is the 
the savior of all men. Savior of all men. doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you lived. Once you are a human being, he's the savior of all men. He's the savior of all men. He's the savior of all men. Shall God my savior. If he is the savior of all men, then why is it that some people will go to hell? Because there is this question that sounds very intellectual, but really quite weightless in intelligence. When they say, if there is God, why do people suffer the way they do? And they continue to say that. But how, if God is good, why will he allow the earth to open and swallow those who rebelled against Moses? Why would the earth swallow church rebels? <laughs> they say if God is a good God why should he allow Elijah to command bear to come and eat children who were just playing and, and making fun of the prophet why should he save just the Jews and allow the armies of Pharaoh and their horses to drown in the sea very expensive chariots why should he judge that way why should God bring judgment in that way why should he allow Sodom and Gomorrah to perish why, if God is good what kind of God will bring flood and clear everybody even global women can do that <laughs> why could he do things that we are trying to prevent global women from doing he does it times 20 times 100 he does it. If God is good, why is he doing this? Why can he allow things to happen like this if God is really good and merciful? That is a very easy to question to answer. Why? Because God is a God of justice and the wages of sin. It's a straightforward. It's very easy to answer. The complex question that is very hard to answer is that why are you still alive? You should be asking that question. Why are you still here? Why are you alive? With all the things you have done and with all the wicked things you are doing, why can you still laugh? Why are you able to eat and still visit the toilet? God doesn't lock you up. <laughs> think about it. Why are sinners enjoying their husbands and wives and producing children? God should have blocked them from not having children. Why is your business doing well? Why are sinners passing exams? That is a bigger question. Do you know why? Because God is a savior. And he's the savior of how many people? All men. That's why you can be messing up and it's still saving because Bible talks in Romans chapter chapter 2 verse 4 that forbearance, his long suffering his forbearance, Bible says that oh do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads us to repent, God is good so he's waiting he's just waiting because he's the savior of all men but pastor, this begs another question. If God is the savior of all men, then, then no one should go to hell. Don't miss that next phrase. Especially, verse 10, especially those who believe. So there is special salvation that believers and Even though God is the savior of all men, the extent to which he's sal saving power can go is limited by our disobedience or obedience. By our faith or unbelief. So he says God is the savior of all men especially it goes further for those who believe. Those who believe cannot suffer eternal damnation. They cannot burn in hell. If you burn in hell it's your fault. God my savior. God my, God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my Savior. God, my Savior. God, my Savior. 
my savior. Oh, my savior. That is the gospel. And he's the savior of all men. If you know Jesus and believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only because he said that whoever believes it should not perish. So the choice is your, it's dependent on you believing. And that's why we can't stay in and be happy and just that. We have to go to the world and tell them the gospel. The gospel is Jesus saves. Jesus Jesus is that savior. God is our savior, but Jesus is the savior of all men. The savior of the world. Jesus, 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 the savior of the world. Say, so God, my savior. For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For there is no Greek or Jew. For the same Lord is rich unto all. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Chapter 4, verse 11, it says that, For there is no name given amongst men by which salvation can be activated. There is one way to activate salvation. There is one way to activate the Savior. The saving grace of God. The saving attributes of God comes through one man. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Jesus to any other man. Because we understand from Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 that this is harmless. He is separated from sinners. He is fitting for us. He says that for, for such a high priest is fitting for us. You know the way you are going to do a wedding and then they try to oh, no, say, this, this wedding dress is fitting for you. You go to the uh, bridal shop. They check this. The, the, one, the, the cleavage is too exposed. No, no. You are a pastor's wife. You can't. Oh, you are a serious Christian. You can't wear that. The other one is so tight. It's like it's cut all the way, almost here. No, no. You are a dignified woman. You can't. You can't wear that. It's not fitting. And this other one with nicely covered and beautifully crafted. You wear it and you feel like a princess. And it's, oh no, this is fitting for your position. This is fitting for the kind of man you're about to get married to. I'm telling you, our high priest is fitting. This high priest is fitting for ah. Somebody shout hallelujah. For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. A high priest is fitting. You know that when they say it's a fitted dress. Some of you here, you can't wear fitted. <laughs> slim fit, you can't wear it. Excuse me. You can't wear slim fit. <laughs> I know you can wear extra slim fit. Fitted. But it doesn't matter whether you can wear slim feet or plus size. Our high priest is fitting for us. Oh, Oh, Such a high priest is fitting for us. Such a high priest is fitting for us. Shout Jesus. He said, such a high priest is fitting for us. Who is holy? He is harmless. He is undefiled. Separated. Don't compare him to Muhammad, excuse me. Don't compare him to Buddha, excuse me. Don't compare him to Confucius, excuse me. Don't compare him to American president, excuse me. Don't compare him 
to any great one as Caesar. No. Don't compare him to the sun. The sun. Don't compare him to the stars. Horoscope. Horror. Horror. Don't compare him. He's holy. He's not horror. Don't compare him to your boyfriend. Excuse me. He's separated from sinners. That's why he could save us. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. He said, Who desires all men? That's the desire of God. You don't need Mary for that. God actually has that desire. So what he did in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 was that God in Christ Jesus was actually he himself was work, reconciling the world to himself. He, he, he was doing the reconciliation. You can do it. Watch this. That is why the gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth. Because they are looking for God. They are worshipping things that are not God. Because there is only one God. In Jude chapter 1 verse 25 there is only one true God. Jude 1 25 Jude to God our Savior who alone is wise (laughs) all the rest are foolish God is our Savior God is our Savior God is our Savior First John chapter 4 verse 14. That's the one I actually wanted before Jude. said, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. The Father who is the Savior, he has come in the form of the Son. A Savior, not of the Jews, not of the Brits, not of the Americans, excuse me, not of the Europeans. Anybody who tells you Christianity is a European religion is very dumb and unintelligent and unlearned. Listen to what I said. Very dumb, unintelligent, watch, and unlearned. Why? Because actually, from history, no great religion has emerged outside of Asia. All the great religions of the world come from Asia. Christianity, as I normally say jokingly, Moses was never Scottish. I don't have time. Sit down. Someone shout, God, my Savior. God is a Savior. In, uh, let's go to Titus. In Titus chapter 1 verse 3. Titus chapter 2 verse 10. Titus chapter 3 verse 4. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. God is a savior. God. Titus chapter 1 verse 3. Verse 3. But has in due time, I think this one got my attention a bit. And this thing, has in due time manifested his word how? If you don't like preaching, you can't see the manifestation of God. Yeah. Who preaches? Preachers. So to like preaching, you have to like preachers. Satan has injected all kinds of false preachers into all kinds of dead churches. So as to downplay the centrality, the importance of and the uniqueness of preachers. So how can they call on him on whom they have not heard? Have they done believed? How can they believe on whom they have not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? Listen, it takes a preacher to be saved. It takes a preacher to discover God, to know God. I'm talking about a preacher who teaches the wholesome words of God. Stop playing church and start engaging in the kingdom. In Titus chapter chapter 2, verse 10, Titus chapter 2, he said, not pilfering, but, you know pilfering, when you go to work and you nick the pen, 
those small small the one you've been nicking and it's just, yeah you think oh it's not a big deal yeah those pil- pilfering 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 some of you are pilfering you've been pilfering not pilfering but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all times. Chapter 2, verse 13. Look at verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, verse 4. I think I will end on that one. He says that, but when the kindness, oh, let's go to, let's go, let's go to verse, uh, verse 3. Verse 3. For we ourselves, say we ourselves. We ourselves. All right, all right, just make it, say me, myself. Me, myself. Let's see if you fit into it. We ourselves were once foolish. <laughs> Especially girls when they fall in love. <laughs> when a woman falls in love, it can be very, very dangerous. Your stupidity kicks in when you fall in love, especially when you're a young woman. Yeah. Even some old women is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you've left church, you've gone to the nightclub because of a boy. Yeah. We ourselves were foolish, but thank God that we were, but are no more. We were, but are no more because of the goodness of God. Watch this. We ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving, uh, uh, serving various lusts. You came to church to come and chase a boy because you are, uh, you are serving various lusts. Your lust was leading you. But thanks be to God that God is a savior. <laughs> thanks be to God that God is a savior. God is a savior. God is a savior. Shout God my savior. Serving various last and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness, the kindness and the love of God, our savior, towards man appeared. It's, it is kindness and his love. Because he's, he's, he's a savior, his kindness and his love made you change your state. Change your status. We are here because... Not because we are too smart, but because God is a savior. God is a savior. That's why they could be killing them, but they have tasted God and they can't change their confession. If you know God is a savior, you will not be ashamed of his gospel. He said, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But bear with me or share with me in the suffering for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed. Romans chapter 1 verse 6. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because God is a savior. He cannot save without someone going to tell them. You have the message of reconciliation in your mouth. In the book of 2 Corinthians, I quoted it earlier on chapter 5 verse 18. He said, God in Christ was reconciling us to himself. Come on, that's so good. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the job, the assignment of telling them that Jesus is the savior of the world. When we go out and we are preaching, we don't have any message. There's only one message, that Jesus is the savior of the world. Because Jesus' personality, his his identity, the uniqueness of his identity and the exclusivity of his works on the cross makes him the savior of the world. He's unique. He's different. The Bible said he's separated from sinners. 
And he's fitting to be a high priest. He's different. And then his work on the cross, he conquered death. He sw- death was swallowed up in victory. Can you imagine? He abolished death and brought life and, and immortality to light through the gospel. So we cannot not preach the gospel because God wants to save all men. But there is no name given amongst men by which we must be saved except the name Jesus. For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, God, our Savior. God, our Savior. God, our Savior. Thank you for listening to this message by David Entry. When God speaks, works show. And the works will surely show in your life. To hear more from David Entry, follow him on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and subscribe to Caris Church on YouTube. Don't forget to share and subscribe to our podcast so you're always up to date. Be blessed.